I thought I should start out by defining a bank. Um, the word bank, by the way, means counter or tabletop, where bankers used to do their business. Uh, that's the English word that emerged in the uh, 15th century. Uh, but the banks, of course, precede that with other names. Uh, what is it that is the characteristic activity of banks? Um, I would say the most, maybe the most characteristic thing is that banks earn spread income. That is, they borrow at a lower interest rate and lend it out at a higher interest rate, and they make the difference. Your deposit rate is lower than the rate at which they charge for the loans they make. So that's the spread income or margin. So that might be considered the core idea of a bank, that, that you, you borrow at a lower rate than you lend. But I'm not sure that that summarizes it either. There's other aspects of banks that we'll, we'll talk about. Um, another um, aspect of banks traditionally has been note issue. That is, they print paper money, uh, and then it circulates and goes, you, you have some of these in your pocket. <laughs> they're, they're, they're currency. Uh, if you stop a person on the street a couple hundred years ago and say, what is the essence of a bank? I suspect the first thing they would say is, oh, they print money, and that's the paper money that we use. But you don't think of it this way. That's probably not, <laughs> because most of that function all over the world has been shifted to the government banks, the central banks in, in the various countries. And so uh, you don't think of private banks as issuing banknotes. But they used to, and it used to be prominent. Uh, the private bank issuing of notes today in the world, I believe, is concentrated primarily in two countries. One of them is the United Kingdom, and the other one is Hong Kong. There's other aspects of a bank I want to emphasize. One is liquidity. And this is an essential element of banking as well. And I'll come back to that when we talk about theory in a minute. But banks offer liquidity by <coughs> borrowing short and lending long. This is different from spread income. I'm saying the interest rate is lower on the borrowing of the bank than the lending of the bank. There's another discrepancy. The maturity is longer on the lending of the bank than the borrowing of the bank. So banks are providers of liquidity. That means a business wants to borrow money, or let's say a homeowner wants to borrow money to buy a home. Right? There, let's take that example, that's more familiar. You're going to lock up the money for th maybe 30 years. You don't, you don't want to pay the loan back tomorrow. What if the lender says, I need the money, give it back? You can't give it back, or you don't want to give it back. So what a bank does is it takes deposits, and allows people to cash them in whenever they want. It lends the money out long on 30-year or so loans. So it generates liquidity. The borrower has what he or she wants, which is a 30-year loan. The lender has what they want. They have, uh, they have a, um, a loan, um, an account they can get at any time. But the problem with it, and so this is an important function of banks, but the problem with it is that there's a problem of crises. Because if everybody asks to pull their money out at once, they can't do it. The banks, in normal circumstances, generate liquidity, but they create a system that's vulnerable. And so the banking industry um, has been uh, plagued by frequent crises throughout history. Renaissance times, uh, where they actually had a banking institution. And that's where the oldest bank in the world today uh, exists. 
it's a uh, uh, Banca Monte uh, de DEI Pashi uh, in Siena. And that means the bank of the mountain of sheep. The same <laughs> it's the same analogy, I guess. Um, I don't think called their interest lambs, but uh, and so that bank was set up in uh, 1472. Uh, that, that's the oldest surviving bank in the world. I went there. You can go there if you visit Siena, and they have a little museum on the uh, first floor near the lobby. And uh, it's actually the third largest bank in Italy. Uh, very old institution. Uh, it's interesting that the, this bank, which was founded in 1472, was founded as a philanthropic institution to lend money to the poor. And wealthy donors in Italy gave money to set up this bank. It goes beyond that now. It's not just lending to the poor. Um, the other thing uh, is in the 1600s, they gave it deposit insurance. Believe it or not, uh, the, the Duke of Siena uh, said he would guarantee all deposits. So uh, deposit insurance appears to have been invented in Italy as well. Uh, but a lot of people emphasize when they talk about the history of of banking. I was reading uh, in pre preparing for this uh, histories of economic histories to see what they would say about banking. And uh, Professor Clive Day, a professor here at Yale, wrote a book called Theory, oh, uh, History of Commerce in 1907. Uh, you can pick up his book if you want to on Google Books. It's past its copyright. And I had great fun reading it. Uh, he's long gone, professor at Yale. Um, but his history begins in England with the so-called Goldsmith Bankers. What happened was, in England, in the six, uh, maybe 1500s or 1600s, somewhere around that, goldsmiths who made gold jewelry had safes where they were good places to store gold. And so people would go to the goldsmith, uh, and maybe they were having jewelry made, but then they'd say, could you keep some of my gold in your vault? And so the goldsmith banker would say, all right, I'll do that. And I'll give you a note saying, I'll, I'll promise to pay you this amount of gold that's in my vault. So sometime when you're out shopping, the goldsmith banker's note would be in your pocket still. And you'd, you'd want to buy something. So you'd say, well, I've got this gold. You talk to the merchant and you say, I've got this gold that's in the goldsmith. I've got his note here. So the, uh, the merchant would say, all right, I'll take that, but you've got to endorse it over to me. Write a note on the note saying that uh, this thing is being transferred to me. And so I can go to the goldsmith and get it out. And that's how paper money got started in England. Uh, it started to circulate with many endorsements on it. And then finally the goldsmith said, well, let's forget about endorsing it to one person. Let's just say to the bearer. And so the paper money started developing kind of spontaneously. And then the goldsmiths noticed, you know, they've got all this gold in their vault. They can lend it out. Why not? Because nobody ever comes and asks for it. Now that these paper notes are circulating, nobody asks for it. So I'll start lending it out. And they didn't have to pay any interest on the notes because people would hold them anyway just because they valued the safekeeping. I guess they were paying interest in the sense that they were providing the safekeeping. So that's how uh, banking got started in England, but it was really preceded in Italy. The most important type of bank is called a commercial bank. Uh, and these are banks that take deposits. You can put your money in the bank, and then it will pay you interest. Uh, and it will also make loans of various kinds. Uh, but most characteristically, business loans. Uh, commercial banks were the most, even more prominent 100 or 200 years ago because they didn't do mortgages and consumer loans. That, it was all business loans uh, initially. So this is kind of the historic, important kind of uh, bank. And in 2010, uh, the total assets uh, of U.S. 
commercial bank, uh, of US located commercial banks was 14.6 trillion. But actually, a lot of that was foreign commercial banks operating in the United States. Of that 14.6 trillion, uh, only 10.1 was US chartered banks. So bankers operate all over the world. And so we have banks like H, uh, I've mentioned Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank Corporation, or the various Swiss banks that have big operations, or Deutsche Bank, big operations in the United States. So they account for almost a third of our commercial banks. Uh, but then there are other kinds of banks, and they're smaller in terms of this is assets of the banks. It's not their market cap. M market cap would be much lower, because remember, offsetting these assets are liabilities they owe to the depositors. Uh, so, uh, but there's other kinds of banks. There are savings banks, and uh, uh, in in the in, in the U.S., they um, savings banks. Um, had only 1.2 trillion. Uh, these uh, savings banks were generally, they tend to be old institutions that have grown very large over time. They're the result of a savings bank movement in the 19th century, which was a philanthropic movement to set up banks for uh, lower income people. Because commercial banks traditionally wouldn't take deposits from small, uh, you'd have to have a minimum size. They didn't care about, they didn't deal with ordinary people. So they created savings banks to encourage uh, thrift and saving. Actually, it follows on a UK movement, savings bank movement in the UK. And they're still with us, but they're not, as, uh, not so big. And there's also credit unions. That's another social movement. And they're only uh, 0.9 trillion, or about 900 billion in assets. Credit unions are basically clubs of people that belong together in some group. Uh, so you can, if you have a company, you can set up a credit union for the employees of your company. Uh, they're, they make both savings banks and credit unions make a lot of mortgage loans. That's kind of their characteristic. Uh, characteristic business. But I wanted to mention uh, the theory of banks was uh, uh, laid out in the Diamond Dibvig model uh, in the Journal of Political Economy, 1988. They were both colleagues of ours at Yale. They've moved on, uh, so I know them both. Uh, Doug Diamond and Phil Dibley. But what they described is a model, I'm not going to give you the model, just to tell you about it. A theoretical model of banks as providers of liquidity. Uh, that uh, liquidity is an economic good that you can somehow get for nothing. It comes out of, well, it's just like portfolio diversification. It, uh, we don't need to expend any resources to get diversification. We just have to manage our portfolios right. Similarly, you set up a bank, and lo and behold, liquidity appears, and it makes it possible for people to live their lives better. I mentioned, you know, you can live in a house for 30 years, or you can move whenever you want. Uh, but the problem with, th with this is that there are multiple equilibria. Their model has a good equilibrium and a bad equilibrium, and it depends on expectations. If people think that the uh, banking system is sound and is going to work well. It works splendidly, but the problem is all it takes is for people to suddenly change their expectations, and then it falls apart because you have a run, you have a bank run. So what Diamond and Dibvig did is to provide an economic rationale for deposit insurance. It's a system depo insuring deposits against uh, default of the bank helps people help prevent bad outcomes, keeps us in the right equilibrium. But there's other issues that banks do, problems they solve. One of them is an adverse selection problem. <coughs> 
that plagues securities. I, I didn't mention the alternative to banks for raising money if you're a business are, uh, is that you could issue bonds or commercial paper. You can borrow money directly from the public without an intermediary. Okay? I'm a company. They do this. Uh, I'm a company. I need money to, say, build a new factory. I go not to a commercial bank. I go to an investment bank, and they help me issue some paper to the public. Uh, and we sell it off in some market. The problem with, with, uh, with issuing debt directly to the public is that the public can't judge the quality of the company easily. Right? The, most people are not, who are investors are not good at estimating the value of the security of a company. So they need some kind of experts. If the adverse selection would happen, see, the experts, the people who know, would buy all the good stuff, and it would leave beyond. Uh, people would start to think, I'm not going to buy these securities because why are they being offered to me? I don't know anything. I'm a sucker. <laughs> That's the idea. I'm not a sucker. I just don't know. I may be smart, but I just don't know what the quality of this company is. So I'm, if I just go in there blindly and pick up whatever seems to be out there, I'm going to suffer an adverse selection. I'm going to get the worst stuff, because I'm not looking. I can't look. They're going to dump the bad paper on me. So banks solve that by being in the community, knowing who is borrowing, and, and having a reputation so that instead of you suffering this adverse selection problem, the bank has people who know what's going on. So the thing about banks is they have local loan officers who serve in a particular community, and they know all about that community, and they solve the adverse selection problem. The um, moral hazard problem that banks solve. Uh, the moral hazard is that a company uh, may borrow money and then take a big flyer and do some wild investment. Let's, let's think this, for example. Suppose we own a small company and it's not doing well. We have this great idea. Let's borrow you know, $10 million and let's go to the racetrack and let's put it all on the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, least likely horse to win. All right. And you know, our chance of winning is only one or ten, one of ten. But if we win, I got a hundred million dollars. Okay. If we lose, then hey, we just go bankrupt. We say sorry. Uh, of course, you really couldn't do it at the racetrack. I mean, you'd be sued if you did that. But you see what I'm saying? I would. I, I could see. I wouldn't do that. But I could see wanting to do that. Right? Your company is going out of business anyway. You know, you don't have any prospects. But we, but if we can borrow ten million dollars. Go and bet it on the racetrack, and one in ten will be super rich. We'll have 90 million, right? Pay off the debtors, everything's fine. They won't complain if you win. <laughs> They'll complain if you lose, but then you say, sorry, you know, we're out of business. So it's limited liability. So what banks do is they help solve this problem by constant monitoring, and they make commercial loans. They're effectively long term, but in practice, in officially short term. They keep renewing them. And they can cut you off when they think you're doing something that reflects moral hazard. So the constant monitoring that banks provide solves the moral hazard problem, uh, just as their information collection solves the adverse selection problem. So I, I, I mentioned deposit insurance. Uh, I mentioned that it started in Italy in the 1600s. Uh, but it, it has a long history of uh, governments backing up deposits of banks in order to prevent bank runs. Because bank runs happen too often. People would get a little scare, and they would go to the bank and try to pull all their money out. They'd hear a rumor, and then the whole banking system could collapse. So people in various governments at various times offered guarantees. But the problem is, those guarantees can get really expensive. So sometimes they had a limited guarantee, and so sometimes the deposit insurance scheme would fail. Uh, and so the history of deposit insurance is a checkered one. Uh, 
So in the United States, there were various state governments, local governments, that created deposit insurance schemes before the FDIC, but a lot of them failed. And so people said, this is a crazy idea. But uh, the United States government in uh, 19, I think it was 33, do I have this right? Um, created, I'll put it, I think that's right. The Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation as part of the New Deal under uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And it has never failed to this date. Uh, why didn't it fail? I think because it's hard to know exactly. We never had a big bank run in, since 1933. It seemed to create the psychology that people stopped worrying about bank failures because they thought, they believed they were insured. I guess they believed. Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, and uh, so uh, if you believe it, then th th it, it's one of those funny things. That it's the multiple equilibrium that Diamond Divvick mentioned. As long as people believe the bank system is sound, it is sound. Uh, but we did have a, uh, we also created later another deposit insurance called the Federal Saving and Loan Insurance Corporation that was doing the saving and loan associations, which were a, a type of saving bank. Uh, and that did fail. Uh, and so we had a huge crisis in the United States called the saving and loan crisis in the 1980s. Um, so if the SNL crisis in the 1980s, uh, was um, due to a widespread failure of saving and loan associations, and then kind of a run on the saving and loan. But it, it wasn't really a run because the FSLIC was trusted. And what ended up happening is the F FSLIC had reserves against a certain amount of losses from the banks, but they went through them completely, and then they were bankrupt. So the insurer went bankrupt. What then happened is the United States government picked up the tab, uh, and the total tab was 150 billion. So we, uh, and that restored confidence. I guess the government had to do that. So what you really uh, and, and the FSLIC no longer exists. <laughs> Savings and loans are now insured by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. If you are insuring banks then you better regulate them because there's a moral hazard problem. I just described a moral hazard problem for a, a company that borrows money from a bank, but there's moral hazard problems for banks as well. Namely, banks can do the same trick. I said go to the racetrack, <laughs> borrow money and go to the racetrack. Banks can do that, same thing. I said they wouldn't actually go to the racetrack. They would pick some really risky business venture. Uh, and if it fails, then it all falls to the deposit insurer. Whenever you, this is a fundamental lesson of insurance. Whenever you insure something, you've got to regulate the person insured. Because once you've taken a risk from their shoulders, you create moral hazard for them. Uh, and so bank regulation is very important. So I was going to talk mostly here about the kind of bank regulation that has an international dimension. Uh, and so, what I wanted to talk about is the Basel uh, bank regulations that uh, were generated by an international organization in Basel, Switzerland. They're all about banks having enough money, you know, not uh, taking on too much, enough money for the risk they take. So, let me start with Basel I. Uh, and, uh, because part of Basel I is in force in all three of them. And uh, there's a concept called risk weighted assets, which is in Basel I, and Basel II, and Basel III, essentially the same. OK, so now here's the idea the, 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 uh, we're going to put capital requirements based on risk weighted assets. And what, what does that mean? That means that banks uh, cannot take too many risks. They can't go beyond. They, they have to have enough money 
to back them up for the risks they take. And we'll call that money capital, okay? It's not money, it's not cash, but it's assets that they can use to get them out of trouble if the risky assets do badly. So if we're going to make, we're going to have a requirement on how much capital a bank holds, we have also to define their risks. And so Basel I had a very simple formula to compute risk-weighted assets. Well, it's very simple <laughs> until you get into all the details. Uh, and so uh, you, you'll see the definition of risk-weighted assets. It's in Table 3.3 three in uh, Fabozzi. Uh, but basically, here it is. There's four categories of assets. Uh, the 0% weight, the 20% rate, the weight, the 50% weight, and the 100% weight. The higher the weight, it means more risky, okay? So, uh, where will I write these? Um, I'll do it up here. Now, we're talking about all three, Basel 1, 2, and 3. Zero percent are uh, national, well, I'll say OECD government bonds, national government bonds. The OECD is the or or Organization for European Cooperation and Development, and they had represent advanced, stable European countries. And U.S. government bonds um, are included among them. Okay, what else? Uh, uh, it's basically this. Th th those were the, the. Um, yeah, basically that's it. Now there might be something else in there, and I'm sure there is. But this is the simple. Zero percent rate, because these have zero percent risk. There's no risk, okay? So banks can hold all they want of these, and they don't have to hold any capital. Then next up is 20 percent weight, and that's municipal bonds, now, uh, or local bonds. That's not issued by the national governments, but issued by a city or a state. We're having a municipal bond crisis now. They're suddenly showing their risk, and we're worried about defaults on them. So Basel I was right to give them some weight. They gave them a 20% weight because they thought municipal bonds are pretty safe. Uh, and they're not as safe as uh, national government bonds because there's examples of default. Um, but they also included, there's, some, there's a long list of what they include, but notably Fannie and Freddie. <laughs> Where these are the two mortgage lenders in the United States were included for a 20 percent weight. Because people thought these guys are really safe, and anyway, the U.S. government backs them up. Although the U.S. government said it wouldn't back them up, but you know, we, we all know they're going to back them up, and indeed, they did back them up when they failed. But uh, uh, Fannie and Freddie, prior to the crisis, started increasingly investing in subprime mortgages. And they were uh, issuing subprime mortgage securities that were really very risky and eventually went kaput. Basel I didn't know that, or Basel II and <laughs> Basel III still, they just gave them a 20 percent weight. It was a big mistake. That, that's where the, partly the banking crisis comes. Then there's 50 percent weight, and that's for mortgages, home mortgages. The Basel people thought, there could be some big real estate crisis, so we, you know it's it's something to worry about. So there's more weight than that, and then we have a hundred percent on everything else, but notably loans, like uh, commercial lo loans to businesses. All right. Uh, uh, so those are the weights, uh, and so I just wanted to go through a simple example. Suppose you are a bank. Uh, and you have $400 million in assets on your balance sheet, okay? These are things that you as a bank own. And let's say you have 100 in government bonds, federal government bonds, 100 in Fannie Mae, 100 million, and you have 100 in mortgages that you own directly, and you have 100 in commercial loans. So your total assets are 400 million. 
But you've got to know what your risk-weighted assets are. So what are your risk-weighted assets? Well, I take the 100. Favosi goes through an example, too, but this is very easy. Uh, I multiply the 100 by 0, I get 0. I multiply this 100 by 20%, so that gives me t uh, 20 million, right? I multiply the mortgages by 50%, it gives me 50 million, and I've got to uh, throw all these in. So what, what does that add up to? It's 170 million. RWA, this <laughs> weighted asset, right? It's 20, 0 plus 20 plus 50 plus 100, all right? So those are my risk weighted assets, and then the amount of capital that I have to hold is a percentage of the risk weighted assets. Uh, I, I don't want to go through, I could go through Basel 1, Basel 2, Basel 3. They kept changing these percentages and it's <laughs> as they went along. So I'm just going to talk about Basel 3 because that's going forward, all right? So uh, Basel, and Basel 3 is complicated too. I'm going to uh, just talk to you about common equity requirements. So Basel 3 <coughs> says, and it's, it's an interesting and creative construct. Common equity must be 4.5% of RWA at all times. Uh, but I'll add to that. They have uh, plus 2.5%, which they call a cap capital conservation buffer. And so that adds up to 7%. Now I'll explain. You absolutely have to have 4.5% as common equity. Uh, but if you don't also have another 2.5%, you can't pay out any dividends. So that's not so good. So in reality, uh, you, you better keep 7%. So effectively, Basel 3, this is Basel 3. Not in your textbook, but uh, it's coming uh, all over the world. 7%, okay. Now, incidentally, the interesting thing about Basel III, they're, they're, they're thinking creatively. They added another buffer uh, called a counter-cyclical buffer. Well, that's not added automatically. Uh, and that's another 2.5%. But only if the regulators in the country choose to impose it. And, and here's the idea. We have to stop bubbles before they burst, right? So if, suppose you think that a bubble is building up in your country. Then the regulators are asked by Basel, if they make that judgment, to add another 2.5% to the capital requirement while it's booming. You do this while it's, you don't wait until the crisis to do this because then they'll all be in trouble. And if you, if you tighten up on banks then, they'll stop making loans and they'll crash the whole economy. You've got to tighten up when times are good. So that adds up to 9.5%. OK, so you'd have to hold capital equal to 9.5% of your risk-weighted asset. But presumably, the normal number is 7%. The crisis that we have been through in, it was a worldwide crisis starting in 2007, peaking in 2008 and 2009. Uh, and it caused a worldwide recession, so it's especially vivid in our memory. But I want to just reflect that these crises, we've had banking crises so many times in history that uh, it's not a unique event. Uh, and I just wanted to remind ourselves of a, a, f some, a few other crises. Uh, I'm going to start with the Mexican crisis our neighbor to the south, uh, 1994, five. Under President Salinas, um, 
the uh, government privatized Mexican <coughs> banks. They, they were Salinas was a Harvard-educated um, economist who wanted to modernize the Mexican economy, and they, they, they privatized the government banks and turned it over to the free market, and they forgot to regulate it. And so, um, they, it led to a bank lending boom uh, in, uh, in uh, 1988. Uh, lending was 10 percent of GDP. Uh, 1994, up to 40 percent of GDP. Uh, Salinas did not stop this. He thought this was, and it led to a boom in Mexico. Because lending was going wild, everything was happening really fast, and it led to a bubble and a boom in Mexico. And there should have been a regulator who said, stop it anyway. But there wasn't effective regulation because Mexico didn't, hadn't, it had deregulated, but it hadn't set up the uh, banking institution, the regulatory institution. Asian crisis, uh, 1997, eight. Uh, and this was, uh, it's a very complicated crisis involving a number of Asian countries, but it was heavily related to bank lending. And uh, international banks had lent a lot of money to Asian countries. And uh, the countries then had loans that were, uh, they were dependent on loans that were withdrawn when a sort of a bank run occurred. It was something like a bank run, because the international investors suddenly wanted to withdraw their money from the Asian countries. Uh, and uh, uh, the Asian crisis started in uh, Thailand and Korea uh, and uh, Indonesia, and then it spread all over the world. It reached Russia as a consequence, and it's called the Russian debt crisis. It was a contagion effect, uh, and it got all the way down to Brazil. Uh, you wonder why was Brazil affected by an Asian crisis. Well, the, the world was, uh, it was and is interlinked. Um, so, uh, it's, it's experiences like this that encourages the G20 countries now to agree on bank regulation that will prevent this kind of collapse. Uh, and the last example I have is, again, it's not, this one is not so international, the Argentine crisis of 2002. Uh, uh, this was, uh, again, a, uh, a complicated crisis, but it involved the Argentine government shutting down the banking system in Argentina. Uh, 